It is undeniable that the border policies of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are getting civilians and now law enforcement officers killed. And it's happening right here in Missouri. 605 on a Tuesday. It's not where I ever want to start a show, but it is a story that will eventually be getting national attention. If that does not start happening today, it will be happening soon. And that is that we found out yesterday afternoon that Officer David Lee, St. Louis cop, was killed by somebody in this country who should not be here. Ramon Chavez Rodriguez killed St. Louis police officer David Lee. 18 years on the force, leaves behind two children. And he did not go home to his wife over the weekend because he was killed in what was supposed to be just a routine deal that he probably has done dozens, if not hundreds of times over his career. So on Saturday, there was a one vehicle accident that took place over on the St. Louis side of the state on eastbound I-70, excuse me, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, 8.30 a.m. And that's where Officer David Lee responded. It actually was an off-duty Ferguson, Missouri firefighter who was on her way home and she got into a one vehicle accident. Officer David Lee finds himself responding to that call and he's behind his own police vehicle. He's retrieving traffic cones From his own trunk, when Ramon Chavez Rodriguez was driving drunk in this country illegally, lost control of his 2019 Kia Sorento, spun out and hit Officer Lee. David Lee was pinned between the Sorento and his own vehicle and then was thrown several feet. The off-duty firefighter, who was the person who got into the original accident, the reason that Officer Lee was there, risked her own life, got out of the car, rushed to Lee's aid, took his walkie-talkie, and radioed for help. He was rushed to St. Louis University Hospital and died in surgery at 44 years old. Ramon Chavez Rodriguez had absolutely no business being in this country. And that's why when people say, well, you know... People who are here illegally don't technically commit as many crimes as people who are here legally. They committed a crime to get here. And every single crime that gets committed by an illegal immigrant is a crime that's avoidable. This was avoidable. This is not about whether or not we should have great immigrants coming to America. Of course we should. I come from immigrants, all of us in some way, shape, or form come from immigrants to love and experience and appreciate and try to live the American dream. But what we have done for the last three and a half years, allowing 10 to 15 million people to flood the country illegally, not knowing who they are, where they are, or what their intentions are, is how you end up with Lake and Riley in Georgia, the college girl who goes for a run at UGA. And gets killed on a walking trail by an illegal immigrant. Now you have Officer David Lee. And of course there are dozens of stories in between these two. But that, the one in Georgia, one of the more notable ones. And now you have Officer David Lee, 18 years on the St. Louis police force, losing his life. In something that was totally avoidable. Because you've got a guy who was driving drunk at 8.30 in the morning on a Sunday. Who should not have even been in this country. Oh, and by the way, just so we're all on the same page, this is an individual who already had himself a criminal track record. Rodriguez was on supervised probation for a domestic battery conviction back in 2022, also on the St. Louis side of the state. St. Charles County prosecutors have filed a motion to revoke his probation according to those court records. So this is somebody who people knew on that side of the state who was here illegally who, by the way, was incredibly violent. Just to read you some of the probable cause statement of this guy from a couple of years ago. He tried to strangle a mother, stole a baby, endangered the baby, 
tried to hit the mother with his car all while being drunk. Violent, illegal immigrants need to be deported. And Donald Trump is running on that. That's not anti-immigrant. That's anti-scumbag who shouldn't be in the country. That's what that is. This has nothing to do with whether or not we should have immigration. Of course we should. But this is the kind of stuff that is happening in America and will continue to happen when you have an open border policy. And you flood the country with 10 to 15 million people and you don't know what their intentions are, who they are, or what their plans are. Now, you look at the moment we're living in right now, what happened to Officer Lee over the weekend on the St. Louis side of the state. And now I want to play this clip for you of Kamala Harris back in 2018, where Kamala Harris, you know, this is when she's a U.S. senator in California. Donald Trump's in the White House and she is at a rally. Not a rally, but a little event with uh, Jussie Smollett, Juicy Smollett, as some may call him. The C-list actor who claimed that he was attacked by a bunch of Trump supporters at 1 a.m. in Chicago in mid-January while he was walking out of a Subway sandwich shop. But don't worry, that turkey and cheese, man, that thing didn't have a piece of lettuce at a place. It's amazing how that happens, isn't it? It turned out, of course, he set himself up to be mugged by a guy in a MAGA hat. I mean, what a wacko loser. So this is Kamala Harris, 2018, with Jussie Smollett, chanting, down with deportation. Down, down with deportation. Up, up with education. 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 What does that mean, by the way? Are we supposed to now be giving away, uh, you know, free seats in the classroom? Sorry, your kid gets the boot this week. We got folks who aren't supposed to be here legally who've got to sit in the classroom this week and learn a little English. What do we do? The chant doesn't even make sense, but I guess that's besides the point. Yeah, you're right. It rhymes, John. (laughs) It's a very low barrier for these folks. That was in Los Angeles back in 2018. Down, down with deportation, up, up with education. No. No. Now is the time to do deportations because your administration has screwed this thing up on behalf of this country so royally. We find ourselves in the situation that we're in today where we've got hardworking, good men and women law enforcement officers who are not going home to their families, wife and two kids in Officer David Lee's case in St. Louis. He can't go home and sleep with his wife on Sunday night because you know what? An illegal immigrant was driving drunk in St. Louis who had zero business being in this country to begin with. If you think this is, oh man, a Republican issue, left versus right, then you know what? You're part of the problem. This is an American issue. And you'd think that both sides of the aisle would get on board with this stuff immediately. That this would not be some kind of a, well, that's just a you know conservative talking point. Really? To put the American people first? To deport illegals who are committing violent crimes? Somebody who should have not been in this country after what they were charged with having done back in 2022? Those are the people that you want hanging around? America? There's only so much that we can do. I get it with American citizens who break the law. But, you know, we should be doing more, by the way. But in the case of stories like this, like Officer Lee, they have zero business being in the country to begin with. And that's what makes this even more painful. 913-408-7957. That's the studio line and the text line here on KCMO. I have a very simple question for you. How do you not do mass deportations of violent, illegal immigrants on day one if you're Donald Trump or you're Kamala Harris? 913-408-7957.
It's 615 as we get it rolling on a Tuesday morning. Pete Mundo on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7 FM. As always, we are streaming on the KCMO Talk Radio app. Rest in peace, St. Louis police officer David Lee lost his life on Sunday during what was supposed to be just, you know, a routine stop. How many law enforcement officers in this audience have done this dozens of times? Single vehicle accident, I-70 eastbound. You go into the back of your vehicle, you're taking out the traffic cones, you're setting up shop there, and then you get hit. And in this case, you got hit by an illegal immigrant who was drunk, who was not supposed to be in this country, who had a criminal track record going back to 2022 of being incredibly violent with a woman and her child. And instead, Ramon Chavez Rodriguez ends up taking the life of Officer David Lee. And if this is not something that hits you at this moment in time, as we talk about this issue of illegal immigration in America, after the numbers from the last three years under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, don't let them gaslight you. Don't let them gaslight you into thinking that, there's nothing we can do. Well, you know, illegal immigrants commit crimes at a lower rate than citizens. You can make data and numbers tell you whatever story you want. But every single crime committed by somebody who is here illegally is an avoidable crime. Not much you can do if it's an American citizen outside of prosecute them after the fact. But every single person here illegally who commits a crime, never mind one as heinous as this, is avoidable. 913-408-7957. Shonda's in Olathe first up on KCMO. Good morning, Shonda. Good morning, sir. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, you know, Tim Walls um, said it best on Saturday, this rally in Philadelphia, when he said, you can't afford four more years of this. I think Trump's been in the White House the last four years, but it's been them. They signed over 300 executive orders to get all of these illegals here. No, we can't afford four more years of this. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you, Shonda. You're right. Can't take four more years of this. No doubt about it. There's been enough damage that has been done in every way, shape, and form. Mark's in Liberty. Mark, you're on KCMO. Yeah, good morning. I agree. Mass deportations have to begin. And I have to laugh when the left tries to uh, defend bringing in cheap labor and migrations and massive uh, illegal immigration by saying, oh, we need the workers, we need the workers. You know what? In spite of what the lobbyists who allegedly uh, represent the farmers say, at 350 million people in this country, 20 to 30 million of which are illegal, we have the largest worker pool in our history ever. Mm-hmm. We don't need anybody else coming in for another 25 to 30 years. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it there, Mark. 913-408-7957. It's just common sense, right? It's just common sense. America is a welcoming place. America is a place where you can live the American dream if you bust your butt, you do it the right way, you get a break here and there. And I want you to live whatever your American dream is. I know you want me to do the same thing and raise our families and peace and prosperity and have a good life. And I want that for folks who are not in America right now. But I want it done in a way that you at least have some barrier to entry. And right now, the only barrier to entry is basically walking right across the Rio Grande at the low point, which is all of three feet. And then you come in and, you know, the taxpayer is going to foot your bill to go where you want to go, get you whatever you need. I mean, it's ridiculous. And when you have situations now like this with Officer Lee, who loses his life on Sunday morning to an illegal immigrant from Honduras who had a criminal history in the state of Missouri and nothing was done about it then, this is the stuff that if you are Donald Trump, He should be in St. Louis. I know, I know, I know. We're not a swing state. I get it. But when you combine law enforcement, which people in this country still generally speaking love, and you weave it into the second biggest issue of this election after the economy, 
which is the illegal immigration crisis. I don't know how Donald Trump does not end up in St. Louis. He should. Doesn't have to be long, but he should. Amity in Ottawa. Amity, good morning. You're on KCMO Talk Radio. What's happening? Yeah, I'm all about immigration. We should be helping them instead of belittling them. There's white people, black people killing police officers as well. Yeah, but they're American citizens. Every human being, if it was easier for them to come over legally, they try. I tried to get my my son's grandmother to come, who was 65 years old, to see her grandson being born. They denied six times. I paid $500 six times. Something needs to be done. And I paid $10,000 for my husband to become illegal because a lot of Americans think they just come illegal when they get married. If you, you know? want to tell me the system needs improvements, that's fine. But to suggest that, well, you know, well, people in America... Me, okay, black people kill police, white people kill police. It's not just Latinos. I never said it was. No one's making that accusation, Amity. But to look at this situation and say it's not avoidable, it is avoidable. Every crime that's committed by an illegal immigrant is an avoidable crime. Every crime's illegal, uh, same for white and black. No, people it's not. Run. If they're if yes, they're Ameri- if I had they're- a friend who murdered a friend of mine, he ran from the cops for years and then finally got caught. If they're an American citizen, though, there's not much we can do about them being here, right? They're American citizens. If somebody is here illegally, it's an avoidable crime. How do you? That's it's very clear as day, right? How do you not see that difference that I'm making here? I don't. Sorry, I'm all for illegals, and Trump sucks. Thank I'm all you. okay. I'm all for illegals and Trump sucks. It's all about the feels. It's all about the vibes. I'm all for illegals and Trump sucks. To me, it's not even about Donald Trump. Like when you really think about this issue, what does it have to do with Donald Trump? I mean, Trump's talking about it, but frankly, if we had a Democratic Party that had some common sense. This would be a no-brainer across the political aisle. Like, yeah, we have an illegal immigration issue. We have 10 to 15 million people who have come across the border. No one knows really who they are, where they are, what their plans are, what their backgrounds are. Don't have any idea, right? If you had two political parties that agreed on putting America first and the American citizen first, this wouldn't even be an issue. This wouldn't be a talking point for Donald Trump. If the Democratic Party had not lost its freaking mind. But because we have one political party that has obviously a tremendous amount of power in America who has been willing to allow this to happen the last three and a half years, that's how this becomes about Donald Trump. But if we had two major political parties who just put the American people first and put the American citizen first, this would not happen. This would not be an issue. But here we are. Too much winning! 6.49 on a Tuesday morning. Don't forget about Tirade Tuesday coming up at 8.30. It's one of our favorite segments of the week here on KCMO. Start thinking about those tirades. you got an hour and 40 minutes to come up with a good one. So uh, I said yesterday, and then I stumbled upon this clip. It's like, I don't know, these social media algorithms are getting kind of weird. They're listening through your phones to what you're saying. About how Donald Trump needs to tap into a little bit more of that happy warrior mentality down the home stretch here. And Kamala Harris is all about the joys and the feels and the vibes. And there's absolutely zero substance to anything. There are no ideas. But I give her credit because she's trying to at least play in a lane that Donald Trump has more or less abandoned. And if you go back to 2016, Donald Trump had not abandoned the happy warrior lane, the feels, the vibes, the joy. Now, he certainly was a man of substance, whether you liked it or not. He had ideas on how he thought the country could be fixed and corrected. But he also had a little bit more of a smile on his face. Now I get it. The guy has almost been assassinated twice in two months. So, you know, if you have a little less of the feels, a little less joy... That's only human nature. But he lacked it a bit in 2020. He is lacking it in 2024. And if he can bring some of this back with the humor that Donald Trump has, it will do him 
a lot of good with 40 plus days to go until Election Day. Because right now, Kamala has no substance, but she's going for like the joyful warrior thing because Trump's not really in that mode. But let me play this clip from 2016. This is vintage Donald Trump. He's happy, he's funny, he's laughing, but he's also making it very clear. You put me in charge of this country and things will improve because of my policies. We're going to win with every single facet. We're going to win so much, you may even get tired of winning. And you'll say, please, please, (laughs) it's too much winning. We can't take it anymore. Mr. President, it's too much. And I'll say, no, it isn't. We have to keep winning. We have to win more. We're going to win more. (laughs) That's also what it's like being a Chiefs fan these days. Oh, this is too much winning. I can't take any more winning. No, I'm giving you more, more. It's never going to be enough. Oh, man. But that right there, Donald Trump 2016, that is vintage right there. And we forget about that because our memories, and I speak for myself when I say it as well, are so short term. But we forget about some of that where, yes, I mean, the media painted Trump as one thing. We always know that's never been accurate. But that's the kind of stuff where that's Donald Trump's version of being the happy warrior, right? That's Donald Trump getting up in front of the American people and saying, I can do this with a smile on my face, and I'm funny when I do it as well. Ah, oh, you're going to be so sick of me and all this winning, and you're going to say, Mr. President, please, it's too much. And I'm going to say, no, it's not. We need more winning. More, more, more. So as I'm watching Trump last night give one of his speeches, there was an element to that that he brought back. And I thought to myself, more of this. Please, Mr. President. We're going to have the four greatest years in the history of our country. <laughs> Starting on day one, I will seal the border and stop the migrant. Uh, we're going to stop the migrant invasion. We will stop the migrant invasion into our country. Not sustainable by any country. We will carry out the largest deportation operation of criminals in American history. After. We have to. I'd rather not say it. I would rather not say it, but we have to. We will end inflation and make America affordable again. It's not affordable. That was Donald Trump last night in Pennsylvania. And, you know, like Donald Trump does, there's a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of, uh, you know, hyperbole in what he says. But he's making his point clear. We are going to have four great years, and here's in part how we're going to do it, right? That's what Donald Trump is making clear. And it's not just about the doom and gloom of the moment. I mean, the American people feel that pain. The American people have understood that pain more than any bureaucrat or politician has felt over the last three and a half years. But with all that being said... It does say something when you have a politician who says, you know what? Yeah, times are tough, but let me give you something to be excited about. Let me give you something to feel good about. Now, we know that the Kamala Harris campaign obviously has the media on her side, which makes it easier to sell this nonsense about joyful and happy warrior and, oh, man, I'm just here for the feels and the vibes. It helps when you have an entire media establishment on your side with that messaging. But that doesn't mean that Trump can't do it and tap into it effectively, and he can if he plays his cards right. And he's got about 40 days to get that done. And if he can do it, well, he's going to find himself back in the Oval Office. If it's all the doom and the gloom, then you know what? She may end up pulling this thing out, which is crazy to say, but it is entirely possible. 913-408-7957 as we roll up until 7 o'clock here on KCMO Talk Radio. Um, by the way, it does not look like there is going to be another debate between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. He has dug in saying, I'm not doing this thing on CNN in late October. And by the way, nor should he. Um, based on how this one on ABC went a couple of weeks ago, there is no way that he is going to get a fair debate 
a week and a half before an election with these kinds of consequences, and CNN is going to do a fair job. There's no way. They did a good job in June because CNN quickly realized, Jake Tapper and Dana Bash quickly realized there was no saving Joe Biden. And a part of me also wonders if in hindsight, they were part of this coup attempt where they knew Biden was going to bomb out. And they basically said, let him cook. That's entirely possible as well. But Donald Trump should not be agreeing to any more of these debates with um, some of these media folks and think that he's going to get a fair shake. And frankly, you know, he's not great in these settings as is. So why bother with it at this point in time? No reason to. And it tells you a lot that Kamala wants another, right? That tells you that she must feel good about her chances in that debate. She must feel good about the moderators in that debate. And she must feel like something will come out of it for her in that hypothetical debate. There is a VP debate next Tuesday night, but don't worry. We've got our politics in a pint next Tuesday night. We announced it yesterday. Prasanth Reddy running for 3rd District in Kansas and Doug Bedford running for Johnson County Sheriff. We're going to be at American Legion Post 370 in Overland Park off 75th Street. We'll have you out before the VP debate. All right, it's at 6 p.m. So RSVP now at kcmotalkradio.com. Get on there while space is limited. I support the move of Nebraska to come to the conclusion that they are not going to change how they divvy out their electoral college votes with 40 some odd days to go until the election. So there was a movement up there. Nebraska is kind of a weird state, I guess, in a lot of ways. Like Maine, where they're able to divvy up their electoral college votes. They've got five electoral college votes up in Maine. And usually what happens, or at least what's happened as of late, is that four of those electoral college votes have gone to the Republican and one in the Omaha suburbs have gone to the Democrat. And that's probably how it's going to go this time around. Four will go to Trump, one will go to Kamala Harris. That's what all the projections are showing. There was a movement from some in the GOP in Nebraska to basically make it a winner-take-all state. Which, by the way, it should be. But I don't think you go about doing it 40 days to go until the election. Like, why the Nebraska legislature suddenly was like, hey, we should just have a winner-take-all state. I don't know, like 48 other states in this country. That would make a lot of sense. Why they magically just decided to maybe consider this in the fall of 2024 when you've had four years to do it, I don't know. Politicians are not very bright. That's the only obvious conclusion I can come to here. And then to make a push for it while people are literally about to start voting. I don't care what some might say about, well, would the other side do it? I don't know. I don't really care. It's irrelevant. In the end, I want to have like some principles and morals when you're playing this game of politics. I know, but it's warfare. No, no, I've got to sleep at night. So that doesn't really bother me a whole lot. But this is a decision that came down yesterday that basically the legislature did not have enough votes to make Nebraska a winner-take-all state. So they're going to do it the old way. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that it's less likely we get a tie in the Electoral College of 269 to 269. Because here's how this could have gone. The most likely way, you know, you need 270 electoral college votes to win the White House, right? If Nebraska had gone to a winner take all with its five electoral college votes, follow me here. Take a big swig of coffee and follow me here on this. If Nebraska became a winner take all and Donald Trump won Nebraska, which would have happened. And then he also won North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, plus all the other expected states. He would have been at 269. And if Kamala Harris had won all of her expected states, plus Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, she would have been at 269. And then you would have had an electoral college tie of 269 to 269. Now, what happens if there's a tie at 269 to 269? Well, according to the 12th Amendment, what then would happen is the new Congress 
which would have been sworn in on January 3rd, ends up choosing the president and the Senate ends up choosing the vice president. So if you had an all Republican House and Senate, you probably would get a President Trump and a Vice President J.D. Vance. If the Republicans had the House but not the Senate, you could have a situation where it's President Trump and then Tim Walls. <laughs> I was just talking to John about that. That would be fun. Could you kind imagine? I mean, Trump would be ripping that guy to shreds every morning. Trump would fit it into his schedule like a half hour, like make fun of Tim. <laughs> That would be right after watching Fox and Friends would be rip on Tim Walls for 15 minutes. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That would be hysterical, actually, to have Trump trying to figure out how to work with Tim Walls on a daily basis. (laughs) But that's how this would theoretically go. Right. So there there was a chance that if Nebraska had moved to a winner take all state, the most likely outcome of a 269 to 269 electoral college tie would have been through Donald Trump winning Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada, all of Nebraska, and then losing the blue wall of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So this now makes it unlikely that that is going to happen. But what it does mean is that if you end up in a situation where Kamala Harris wins that blue wall, and Nebraska is still split, well, then she gets herself the 270. And that's why, you know, if you're a Republican and you're like, well, Nebraska should change the rules, this divvying up electoral college votes is dumb. Yeah, and it's been dumb for a really long time. It's been dumb since they started doing it. But some states got to be different. Like Nebraska also has this weird setup where they just have one legislative body they don't have a house and a senate they've just got one big legislative kind of parliamentarian body that operates up there so it's a little bit different how they do things but you guys had a long time to fix this and to sit there now and be like yeah i think we'll get around to it 40 days to go until the election no that's not the best way to handle it 913-408-7957 is how you join us on kcmo talk radio and this is just quintessential 2024 if things could get any nuttier somehow getting a tie in the electoral college would be quite a way to end what has been a historically insane year because you've had this happen before i mean it's been a long time but you've had this happen before it happened in the 1800 election rematch of uh, jefferson and john adams You had it in 1824 as well. So there have been times when this has taken place, but it has been a very long time, obviously, since anything like this has happened in American Electoral College history. So now you sit there, you wait, you see how it's going to play out, and you know that, (laughs) oh my goodness, the odds of it happening are very slim, but it's not impossible. Like there are multiple different, and I saw, I think CNN had a piece on this on their website. If you play with the Electoral College map and you can do it on this website, 270towin.com, you can go out there and you can look at how each state would break out to get Donald Trump to 270, to get Kamala Harris to 270, and how you could theoretically wind up with a 269-269 tie. There are ways that it ends up happening. And that's why it's also just as important, by the way, for the Republicans to hang on to the House of Representatives. And that's not a slam dunk either. But they have got to hang on to the House of Representatives because it could end up playing a role in who the next president is, believe it or not. Ah, The bad ideas keep flowing in to try to figure out how to improve the crime situation in Kansas City, Missouri. By the way, Bill Nigro, Westport businessman, will be here in studio in about uh, 15 minutes on KCMO. Talk about the prosecutor's race, his endorsement, what's going on in Westport, how to make things improve as soon as possible. So KCTV5 obtained through an open records request emails that were sent between city manager Brian Platt and members of the city council on how to get... Uh, the police force to be more efficient 
how to get criminals off the streets, how to improve the crime situation in Kansas City, Missouri. And here's that report from KCTV5. The email was sent from city manager Brian Platt to several city council members back in April. The below initiatives and directives will serve to better address the record high crime and safety issues in all neighborhoods. It contains his perspective on what's going on in Kansas City. We don't have jail space, so we have to release people early. And also, KCPD is less inclined to make arrests because of lack of prosecution. It includes 20 major ideas to change the police department. Mandatory overtime for police officers, an audit of special units, eye in the sky, that's aerial mass surveillance, a proposed partnership with the Jackson County Sheriff's Department, and eliminate the, quote, costly helicopter unit switch to drone. Were you aware that this email was being sent? You know, I was not. Didn't write it, didn't come up with it, but I think it does suggest, you know, maybe these are things that we can do now to make things better. One thing suggested here is mandatory overtime. Yep. Do you think that needs to happen? It's certainly something that we've done at the fire department for years. Uh, it has allowed us to be fully staffed up, to not fall behind on, on calls for service, to be able to address them. And so if there is a public safety crisis, which I believe there is right now, this is something absolutely the Board of Police Commissioners should evaluate. All right, that's KCTV5 and uh, Quentin Lucas, of course, commenting there at the very end. So I appreciate Brian Platt noting that, yeah, not having a jail space results in people getting released early. Who would have ever foreseen that being a problem when they shut the jail almost 10 years ago? Hmm. Wow. Like only anybody with an ounce of common sense, when you combine not having jail space with really bad and woke prosecution who likes going after cops more than criminals, I can't imagine what that formula is going to turn out. It wasn't like the jail was at 50% occupancy either when it was in existence. Yeah, right? absolutely. And then I do appreciate Brian Platt noting that a lack of prosecution means that KCPD is less inclined to arrest people. Jeez, let me go through putting my life on the line on this arrest to then have the same person back out on the streets in hours, if that, knowing full well the prosecutor's office won't prosecute them because, well, the real criminals in our society or the real victims in our society are the criminals. That's the approach of this Jackson County prosecutor's office. And it has been for a long time. It's been really just on steroids since 2020. Mandatory OT. Okay, I know that the firefighters have that. But I think firefighting is a little bit different than... Being a police officer. Tell a cop coming off a 12-hour shift in KCMO in some of the worst neighborhoods in this town. That, By the way, uh, you got to punch in a couple extra hours today. All right, mandatory OT. See how that goes over. For a police department that is already stretched thin, that is already in large part demoralized by city council, social media, prosecutor's office, See how that plays out for you. And then also, you know, the idea of no helicopters and switching to drones. Well, you know, I know the fire department uses drones, but fires don't run from cops. Okay? Like, you're not chasing bad guys with the fire department drones. You do need to do that as cops, Right. You're chasing bad guys who are running between properties and homes and behind homes and hiding in woods and all these different things like the fire department doesn't really have that need. It seems like uh, in pursuit with a drone, it's kind of like the deal about outrunning a bear. You just have to be faster than the guy behind you. Yes. Yes. So eventually you could probably outrun that. I mean, you got up. Those things have obviously a, uh, what's what I meant, a perimeter. Yeah. You know, they do. So, and you operate them from the ground. I mean, what are you can do? Walk into the building, you know, fall, you're doing the deal. It's almost like a game, right? Video game. Well, I, I could guess, run it from my old N64 controller. Maybe. Obviously a helicopter from the air has no barriers and can go in straight lines in pursuit. Yes. And which is not need. limited to a radius. No. And you need that. So I'm just sitting here and thinking to myself, these are some bad ideas overall. Um, (laughs) But then 
I was also going through the KCTV5 report where they sunshine requested some of these emails between city manager Brian Platt and um, some of the city council members. And I think the most offensive part of Brian Platt's email is that he puts his freaking pronouns in his email signature. I mean, come on. What is that? Brian Platt, he, him. I mean, I, I, I've got no beef with Brian Platt. I think he's pretty decent city manager. But come on, brother. What is this? The he, him? The, the minute I get an email from somebody with pronouns in their signature, I delete the email. I don't care what it says. I don't care who it's from. I don't care what the offer is for a guest. I delete the email. I just, I can't take you seriously. Wow, your name's Brian and you're a dude. Wow, great. Talk about a bombshell. Can't believe it. Shocker to me. So that was the worst part of the email that obviously KCTV5 was not going to jump in on. But I did notice it when I was seeing their screenshots. But all in all, what you have here is a city council chasing its tail. They helped create the environment that we find ourselves in right now with law enforcement. They can deny it all they want. But Mayor Lucas and I talked about it last week. And I said, hey, has the approach of the last four years when it comes to policing policies in this country and in this city impacted where we are today? And he insisted the answer was no. I could not disagree with him more. I know that doesn't surprise you. But when you take the approach that many took four years ago, where you demoralize police, you treat them like crap, you say their jobs don't matter, you say they're secretly out just trying to kill innocent people, and then you wonder why you can't recruit, you wonder why there are record levels of people who are leaving police forces, you wonder why they don't want to prosecute and chase bad guys when they don't trust the prosecutor's office to do its job. And they're more, more, they're more worried about getting prosecuted themselves than they are the criminals they're chasing. That's how you create the debacle that you've got right now in Kansas City, Missouri. And then it spreads beyond the high crime areas to places like Brookside and Waldo. And that's what we are living through right now. This is a great example of what we were just talking about with Bill Nigro. Sun Market, uh, Sun Fresh Market, 31st and Prospect, is at risk of closing due to escalating crime in the neighborhood, according to the store's owner. This is uh, from Channel 9 KMBC. Now, this should not be a surprise to anybody, sad to say. But when you look at the last 40 years and how bad public policy demoralizing the police force and having prosecutors who don't do their jobs actually impacts those in the poorest communities the most. This is a prime example of that, right? So the owner of this Sunfresh Market says people have to walk through a war zone to get inside the store. And what's happening? Well, uh, they're at risk of closing. So all the time, what do you, oh boy, we've got food deserts. You've heard that phrase, right? We've got the food deserts in parts of Kansas City. It's certainly been an issue for the last 30 years in the area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, first off, I agree. We need grocery stores. Now, in a perfect world, the free market capitalistic environment would take care of this. And somebody would say, I'm going to open up a grocery store here. Even if it's a poorer part of town, I can turn a profit. I can make money. But then if you can't and you need the government to subsidize, which is what's going on here at this Sun Fresh Market at 31st and Prospect, you say, okay, the least that the government can then do through a police force and through a prosecutor and through a competent city government is make sure that that food store is a safe place for people to go and shop. And now you've got this place that's subsidized. That needs another, according to the owner, half a million dollars to stay open past the holidays. Can't even guarantee public safety. So these public safety issues have major impacts on the poorest parts of town. And the bad public policy that we have lived through in Kansas City, Missouri in particular, is impacting the people in the poorest parts of Kansas City the most. They deal with the highest rates and levels of violent crime. They have more criminals, obviously, on a per capita basis than you have in other parts of town. What does that then lead to? It leads to, obviously, more crime, but also it leads to 
food store owners saying, you know what, we can't even operate beyond the next couple of months unless we get half a million dollars from the city to stay open. And by the way, can you get the criminals off the streets around here? Yeah, this is, I saw the piece, and so this isn't about people stealing food from the store where you say, gosh, they're hungry, they need to steal food, we should give them food. This is about the things that go on in the parking lot, the drug deals, they're saying prostitution and things like that. So people just like trying to get to the door yeah. where they do have an armed guard, you know, is is the problem. Right Vandalism, now. The neighborhood. Mm-hmm. prostitution, yeah. sex trafficking, mm-hmm. drug activity. Imagine walking your kid, I mean, how many of you, as I have done dozens of times, we'll take one of the kids to the grocery store. Hey, you got to go grab some milk and eggs, which in Biden's America now is like $17 for those two things. But uh, besides the point, hey, what's going on there, Dad? Oh, I don't know. Just a couple of lovebirds, you know, doing their thing. That car's going up and down. <laughs> what's that, Dad? Yeah, well, what's wrong with the tires on that, that thing? Yeah. <laughs> no comment. Go inside. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're not doing that. I mean, that's the stuff that's happening in the parking lot. And for many of us, that is unfathomable. But by the way, these people live in these neighborhoods because that's what they can afford. And they deserve safety and security and not having hookers messing around with Johns in the parking lot and drug deals going down in front of them and their kids when they're walking in to buy milk and eggs. They deserve that just like you and I do. That should not be contingent on where you live, on your socioeconomic status. But here's the problem, by the way. The same woke fools in some of the wealthiest, ritziest parts of town who like to vote and support this nonsense don't realize that it doesn't impact them in Prairie Village, Wokewood, and elsewhere. But on the east side of Kansas City, it does. It does. And until some of these people start waking up to that, it's not going to change. I want it to change for everybody's sake, but it's not going to change. You got to wake up your city council. You got to be active. You got to tell them we care about criminals. We care about crime. And it's not just about those of you in Brookside and Waldo where you're getting hit with, you know, uh, smashing grabs or on the plaza and cars are broken into. It is worse than that in some of the poorest parts of Kansas City. And you have people running these operations who want to see change, who want things to improve. But they also have to run a business, right? It's like I I can only run the business so well and so effectively when I've got vandalism, prostitution, sex trafficking, and drug drug activity happening in my parking lot. There's only so much I'm going to be able to do And there's only so much business I'm going to be able to drive to my place of operation. Before you have to look at your city and say something needs to change. And you can hire private security. You can do that at the door. You can do it. Westport's done. And I know there are other business owners around Kansas City who have their own security for their strip malls and things like that. But in the end, why are you paying taxes? Why are you paying tremendous levels of taxes if you can't even get law enforcement to show up and drive around? You can't call 911 and feel confident you're going to have an immediate response. If you can't get that done, what are you paying your government for? If you think that the illegal immigration crisis is just made up stuff for political gain, well, you're fooling yourself and you're also being a fool. Tragedy struck the St. Louis side of the state on Sunday morning when an 18-year officer in St. Louis City lost his life at the hands of an illegal immigrant. The officer leaves behind a wife and two children. David Lee is his name. And what was David Lee doing at 8.30 on a Sunday morning? He was doing what he's probably done dozens of times during his career there was a single vehicle accident on i-70 eastbound and he was getting out of his car he was standing outside of his trunk he was pulling out traffic cones and he was going to set up shop to help out this individual who happened to be an off-duty firefighter from ferguson missouri get well and get on her way after the single vehicle accident 
He then was hit and pinned to his vehicle by Ramon Chavez Rodriguez, who was driving drunk, was an illegal immigrant from Honduras, and who, by the way, had a rap sheet in this country going back a couple of years ago. This was a completely avoidable crime. It's not about, well, do illegal immigrants commit crimes at a larger rate than American citizens? It doesn't matter. Because every single crime that is taking place in this country at the hands of somebody who is not supposed to be here is an avoidable crime. And to tie it in what's been a conversation over the last couple of weeks on this show, it's the issue of the Lenexa homeless shelter proposal at uh, I-35 and 95th Street. There were those of us who said, hey, we're not against the homeless. The homeless need help. We're a generous people. The homeless need help. And in a perfect world, the homeless get help through outstanding charities and organizations who are privately funded, a la the City Union Mission here in Kansas City which is celebrating 100 years this fall. But I understand there's a role for the public to play in that. The question is, was a low-barrier homeless shelter right off I-35 and 95th Street, where you could have illegal immigrants being housed, was that the right move for Lenexa right off of one of the major interstates in this country where we know there is drug trafficking and human trafficking coming right past us every single day? And the answer was no. Now, last week, Mike Kelly, the Johnson County Commissioner, came on this show and said that, you know, those of us who felt that way were fear mongering. Those of us who felt that way were, um, you know, not being accurate. And our rhetoric was not helpful to the conversation. No, first off, it wasn't rhetoric. We were sharing facts. Facts on how if we're going to have a homeless shelter there, boy, we better well protect the people and do it for the people who are here, who are citizens of at least the area and are at least American citizens. And if you want to build a homeless shelter then that can't do that, then guess what? The people are going to push back and you don't deserve to have that homeless shelter in that location. So this stuff all ties together. And this was Mike Kelly on Friday on this show when we went back and forth on this issue. Uh, and it's disappointing that some of that rhetoric got out there, uh, not only on your show, but on others, talking about what uh, this shelter was and what it wasn't. When you say that this is a low-barrier shelter, that's a drop-off shelter, that's not correct. Anybody that was going to be placed in this facility would have to go through a coordinated entry process uh, screening where people are put on the by-name list and ranked and scored First, trying to find existing services, whether that be vouchers or family, um, and then scored based on their need. So uh, while I think it's easy for people to poke holes at a problem by painting it as, you know, migrants or immigrants or drugs or crime, uh, you know, that's just not fair. And it's a really a disservice to the people who are in Johnson County right now that find themselves. Unhoused. Were you but were you so, going to require residency? Well, if people don't have a house, they they don't have a residency. And so that's the thing. But I mean, ID, uh, but ID, I, were you going to require identification? Well, of course we were going to require identification. People, we need to know who the people are. But again, there are people right here in Johnson County right now that were going to be the priority to be helped in this process. But priority and is not requirement. People, priority is not requirement. Right. But if people who are here in Johnson County right now aren't served or provided services, whether it be through the HSC, whether it be through a voucher or whether it be through something else, what happens to them? They don't go poof and automatically go to somewhere else in the country. They're still right here in our community. This was a good opportunity to address a problem that is already right here right now. But you're not denying the fact that there were opportunities for folks who maybe were here illegally to use this shelter. Correct. There is people who are right here that would have been the priority for utilizing this shelter. If somebody who was who could have been non who be, could have been non citizens, it could have been. But again, what would be the ultimate result if a person who is already here in our community is not helped? They would be on the street. They would be vulnerable to crime. They would be vulnerable to the elements. That was Johnson County Chairman Mike Kelly on the show on Friday.
And what he fails to realize, like so many others, is places like this, if they are low barrier, they can be magnets. And I don't want I-35 and 95th Street, I don't want the center of Johnson County, Kansas, to be a magnet for people who are potentially being dropped off and are not citizens of the area. I don't want that. And if you deny that, oh, that wouldn't happen. There are people here. It absolutely would happen. The United States is one big magnet right now. And it results in officers like David Lee of St. Louis losing his life 18 years on the job for somebody who should have never been in this country and who was committing some heinous crimes while in this country illegally two years ago.